This is Avi Mar Abraham Penhal, presiding Archbishop of the Martoma Orthodox Church. In late March of 2001, we held our annual clergy conference in Fresno, California, at the St. Mary of Magdala Orthodox Cathedral. The theme that year was Oriental Orthodox Spirituality, and under the leadership of Metropolitan Varan Mar Enoch Ash, we were honored by the participation and fellowship of several Orthodox clergy and bishops. The following lecture was presented by the late Dr. Thomas Mar Makarios, who was then the Metropolitan of North America and Canada for the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church, sometimes known as the Indian Orthodox Church. Mar Makarios was a good friend and mentor of our founding Archbishop Ron Mar Enoch Ash, and he, along with other leaders from the Mother Church of India, provided invaluable support and insight during those early years of our mission jurisdiction. I know that you will enjoy this dynamic spiritual message. We are ever thankful for the gift who was His Eminence Mar Makarios. We offer this message in his memory and that of our beloved Archbishop Varan Ash. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Bishop uh, Enoch, for giving me the unusual opportunity to know you or to see you or try to communicate with you too. Since you had a very interesting uh, first session, I hope I will be able to make my session interesting too. <laughs> From the <clears throat> schedule, I discovered that I'm supposed to speak for an hour and a half. For a professor, it is too much. <laughs> we are used to teach only for 40 minutes at one time. But as an Orthodox bishop, it is too little. <laughs> we are notorious for our long sermons. I remember When I finished speaking in a Presbyterian church once, <clears throat> a woman came to me and simply said, TGIF. Here it means, thank God it is Friday. <laughs> I asked her why she said that. She said, thank God it is finished. <laughs> She said the speech was too long, too boring, so uh, she was happy that it was all over. <laughs> my grandfather, my grandfather's brother was a priest. He used to preach for three hours in the church on Sundays. Most people were sleeping and he didn't care. <laughs> he went on speaking and uh, he spoke for three hours. People didn't understand anything. People didn't hear, hear anything. He didn't understand anything either, what, what he was talking about. <laughs> he should cut short his sermons. Well, he said, why don't you go and buy a clock for me and put it on the wall? Then I remember my father saying, you don't need a clock, you need a calendar. <laughs> So that was some of the things which brought to my mind when I was looking at the schedule. Well, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, much about theological matters or even biblical interpretations which you had this morning and yesterday probably. I want you to know how we live in India as members of the Orthodox Church. 
and I want you to be familiar with the spiritual experience we receive from the church through our families. It is not the theological books, it is not the theological colleges, it is not anything else. It is the family which brings us to a spiritual orientation more than anything else. So I would say that is the basis of orthodox spirituality. The spirituality in the family. The family growing up as a church, as a small church, yeah. as a church in miniature. And then on Sundays, all these small churches come together to form the larger church. It's only in that context, spirituality has any meaning. You may explain it theologically, philosophically, academically, but if you can't find it in the family, it doesn't mean much. And then, that's the way I am looking at it and that's why the way I am going to present it uh, to you too. We belong to, I belong to a family which was a Christian family for about 2000 years now. Our tradition is that St. Thomas baptized, St. Thomas the Apostle baptized four families in India and ours was one of the families. So we had about 2000 years of history, tradition, beliefs and faith backing us up. According to our history, it was our family who supplied, which supplied bishops for the church for the first 19 centuries. It changed only in 1817 or 1818. So with that rich background, the spirituality comes through the family. Metropolitan Enoch told you yesterday, my father died about seven months ago. He was 104. My mother died about two or three months ago. She was 102. And they were married for about 85 years. And they enjoyed life all through that period of time. I asked my class, my students at the college, go to India and see my parents. When I go to India and see them, used to see them, the way they were sitting on the same sofa when they were 104 and 102, and in American language, fooling around. <laughs> I thought they were still having their honeymoon after 85 years. That is what spirituality means to me. Rather than my getting married and after two months sleeping in two different rooms, saying I have a headache, I have a backache, I want to sleep, that kind of thing. So spirituality comes from the family. And when you see these people and grow up, <coughs> you don't need any theology to bring spirituality into your lives. Amen. A year ago, when I went to India, met my mother, went to see her and father too, before they died. The first question she asked me was, Bishop, 
Did you say your prayers today? <laughs> Can you imagine a woman asking a bishop of the church who is 73 years, who was 74 years old then, whether he has said his prayers? Would you dare to ask that to Bishop Enoch? You better not. <laughs> Only a mother can do that. Yes. Only a mother is interested in that kind of question. Mm -hmm. And that is where spirituality comes from, mm -hmm. rather than anything else. I sent two students from the college to our small town where we have a high school back in India for six months to teach in that high school and uh, get exposed to a different culture. <clears throat> then they come back and they tell me, we have a message from your mother. And always, every year, the message was the same, eat well. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's, it, for, for her, I'm still a baby. Her interest is that I should pray in time and I should eat in time. And that is, for me, where spirituality comes from. She used to wake us up at 5 a.m. every morning to pray when we were growing up. Not that we liked it very much, but she did it in any way. She was the first one who woke up. And here is a witness for that. Metropolitan Nina stayed in our house, which I didn't know before. Uh, he was telling me this morning. She wakes up. up we ask, they, she asks us to get together for morning prayer. We had to. There was no choice. Otherwise probably we would not have. <laughs> because there was no choice, we got together to pray for about an hour. Five to six. That was the normal time. One day, we children asked her why we have to get up at 5 a.m., why can't it be at 6.30, 7? Well, her answer was the most profound and theological answer I ever heard in my life. That part of the country is a kind of tropical climate. By 5.30, 6, the sun comes out like Florida, or here too probably, yeah. And she said, by 5.36, the sun comes out, the birds begin to sing, the flowers bloom, all the creatures are alive, all the creatures are recognizing the presence of the Lord, <coughs> their creator, by doing whatever they can, the flowers bloom and look up, the cocks crow and look up, the sun rises and is up there, and you, who are the crown of creation, is sleeping then? <laughs> And she simply said, you better wake up first and make that noise, praising the Lord, so that all the others will wake up and follow you. They are your congregation. 
flowers. The dogs and the cat and the trees and the flowers, all are your congregation. And the priest should stay ahead in front of the whole thing and praise the Lord and the congregation should respond. It should not be the other way around. So it is your priestly responsibility to get up and say, say your prayers. Jesus. And she, I remember, said once, the responsibility is the priestly responsibility. It is not just an ordinary person's creature's responsibility. Because man was created as a priest to begin with, to praise the Lord. That is what priest means. And she said, remember Jonah? His sin was not that he ran away. Instead of going to Nineveh, running to Tarsus, his sin was when all the heathens were praying upstairs in the boat, he was sleeping downstairs. <laughs> He did not exercise his priestly responsibility. <coughs> That's where sin comes. When you don't ex exercise your priestly responsibility to give worship and prayer the primacy, the priority, you are neglecting your priestly responsibility. And that is where spirituality comes. The first thing I always saw in my life every morning when I woke up, since I was, I could remember when I was four years, five years old, when I opened my eyes, what I saw first was my mother sitting in, on her bed, having a piece of cloth on her head and saying her prayers. Whatever she could grab to put on her head, she put it on the head and started praying even before we woke up. And it was often that sound which woke us up. The sound of the mother, the praying sound of the mother. The most powerful thing you can ever hear in your life. Jesus. And that is where spirituality comes from. When we open our eyes, what we would see is her praying and tears coming down. That was tears of joy rather than tears of frustration or anything. She was praying for her children. When I became a bishop, when I was kneeling with four other candidates <clears throat> to become bishop, and when this thing was put on my head, I cried. I turned to the next person, the next bishop, and told him, whispered in his ears, <clears throat> Bishop, this is not what I deserve. This is the piece of cloth Ooh, which I saw when I was growing up on my mother's head. And that is what has come. And that was what was put on my head. Friends, that is spirituality. 
It's not the theology. It's not the philosophy. It's nothing else. It's your family, your prayers, your tears. That is where spirituality all is. Nowhere else. You cannot find it anywhere else if you cannot find it at home. Be very difficult to find it somewhere else. Try to discover that spirituality at home. And mothers have a special responsibility in that. Adding that father's responsibility are not small either. But I would say the influence of a mother to establish that spirituality at home, it's beyond limitations. It's beyond anyone else's influence or power. <coughs> when man was created, human being was created, was created in a special way in his own image and likeness. <coughs> he was created in his own image and likeness. <coughs> there are several interpretations for that. <coughs> but he was created in his own image and likeness because he was the only creature who was supposed to grow and grow and grow and become like him. And that was the original purpose of human beings being created, to grow and grow and grow and become like Him. That is spirituality. Grow spiritually and become like God. Man did. He was created and He was given everything. In other words, he, everything was given to him before he was created. Because everything was created before he was created. So the paradise was created before him. He was created. And one Bible commentarian said, everything was there for him. And then a hungry man was brought into this paradise. A hungry man was created. He was brought into this paradise. And do you know what was the first commandment given to man? Man, this is all for you as food. In other words, eat. The first commandment. Man liked it very much. <laughs> The only commandment he never broke. <laughs> he ate. <laughs> and then the woman was created. You know what was the man did? The first act, human act of man, he slept. <clears throat> that was the first thing he did as a human being. Still continues to do that. You know what was the woman's act, first act? She talked. <laughs> he slept. Without taking care of him, her, so she sneaked out and she began to talk to strangers. That's how sin crept into this world. One slept and one talked. Well, there is one verse in the Bible which is beyond ex human explanation. God repented. Can you imagine that God has to repent 
or God had to repent. He repented because He created human being. He did not repent because He created the dogs or the cats or the bats or the rats. He repented because He created human being. One early church father wrote, God repented. He called a synod up in heaven and the synod met for 6,000 years to decide what to do with this creature. I created him to grow and grow and grow and become like him. He did. He broke the rule. When he was asked to eat, he was happy. When he was given a discipline not to eat from one tree, he broke it. When he was to ask to feast, he was happy to have it. When he was asked to fast, he didn't. Feasting was very important for him, but when he, for the discipline's sake, he was asked to fast, he broke that rule, he didn't like it. So up in heaven, they got together, angels and archangels, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, and discussed for 6,000 years according to one father, maybe allegorical, but, and they came to two or three conclusions. Number one, this creature will never grow. He will never become like me. Number two, therefore, the only choice for us is, let us become like Him. Mm. That is the central theology of the Christian Church. God became man so that man can become God-like. If He doesn't become, grow and become like us, let us go down and become like Him. And that is the meaning of the spirituality of incarnation. But then there was a problem. I need a mother to come down. I can do without a father. But I have to have a mother. Looking down, he didn't see anyone who was qualified to become his mother. So, after passing all the resolutions up in heaven, poor God had to wait and wait for millions of years to see someone who <coughs> could become his mother. That was the time when Mary was born. And he looked at her and said, here is someone who is trying to grow and grow and grow and become like me. She is my mother. She is going to be my mother. No one else could. So he picked her up to become his mother. That was the mother's role in the operation of redemption or salvation. So the mother's role is all spiritual, all pertaining to salvation and redemption. You don't have to look into the Bible or any theology to see what that Mary was all about. Just look at your mother. I look at my mother to see who Mary was. The one who gave spirituality to the whole world. My mother gave spirituality to her children. Saint Mary gave spirituality to the whole world. If you can give a good son to the world, that is your spirituality, more than anything else. You don't have to contribute anything more. Give a good son to the world. 
you don't have to go to Washington to march all over. <laughs> Your contribution is to give a good child to the society. No matter what else you do, it's much less than this. <laughs> <laughs>